Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of Marginal Gains TV. I'm Josh Portner from Silka, and today you'll notice I have uh, a new prop with me. This is uh, Vader, my MacBook, and yes, I do have a Darth Vader sticker on my personal computer um, because Star Wars is awesome. I'll just leave that right there. Today I've brought Vader with me uh, so that we can start playing around with the Silka Pro Pressure Calculator. Uh, and really just give give you guys and, and gals uh, uh, some insight into how the calculator works, where it's pulling data from, kind of how it's thinking, uh, and how we developed it uh, really to be a tool, uh, a tool that everybody can use, uh, but leveraging uh, something like five, six years of Pro Tour tire pressure data. And so the background of this calculator, which looks like uh, like this, let's go ahead and we'll throw the screen up. There we go. Uh, we'll get the screen up here. Um, the background on this calculator is that we have been keeping meticulous logs um, of all the tire pressure optimizations that we've done for various teams and athletes over the past uh, five, six years. It's something like 4,000 data points um, you know, hundreds of athletes worked with hundreds of races. Uh, there's quite a few race wins in here. You know, you want to know uh, Peter Sagan's Paris-Roubaix uh, race winning tire pressure? It's in here. Um, and, and so many others. I think we've got multiple Olympic medals, world championship medals, um, you know, dirty Kanza wins. I mean, there, there's just so much good stuff in here. And what I want to help uh, explain for, for you or really detail out is, is how we've thought about this and kind of what we've learned about tire pressure. So, you know, up until, well, up until the last 10 years, I think we all were just told forever that higher pressure is better, faster, right? More pressure, more faster. Um, and we now know that that not to be the case, right? We've, we've talked about this. We've talked about these asymmetries. We've talked about uh, impedance, right, versus the, the um, casing losses. And so with that knowledge and some amazing tools like high-frequency GPS and, uh, you know, the modern power meter, the Chung method, right, kind of all of these bits and pieces that we've been able to pull together, um, we can do some pretty amazing field testing, and we're doing it uh, really pretty much weekly uh, with athletes of all levels where we can actually vary tire pressure and try to find the, those optimal break points. Remember this, the break point pressure? We, we're trying to find that optimal break point pressure for riders of various weights on certain sizes of tire on certain uh, surface roughnesses. And so uh, let, let's dive into to the calculator here. Let me get it pulled back up. Um, it, and so let, let's start with kind of why these things are important. So uh, item one. Total system weight, rider plus bike plus gear. Why is the total system weight uh, Im important? You know, it's that the tire is the first spring in the series uh, and it is taking all the weight of everything above it. So, you know, the rider, your helmet, your water bottles, your clothing, the bike itself, any bags or packs, any gear you have with you, all of that weight uh, that mass is being supported by the tire uh, at the road surface. And as the road surface gets rough, um, all of that comes into play, right? The, the bicycle has to be lifted over every bump, uh, you know, in, in the entirety of its mass um, every time. And so the tire feels the full weight of the system, uh, which is why we have that in here. The best way to get this total system weight, uh, if you want to be as accurate as possible, gear up, get your bike together, get all your equipment together exactly as you're going to ride it and step on the scale, you know, together, holding the bike, wearing all your kit. That number is, uh, is your number. It's also a good exercise. I think you might be a little bit surprised at um, j just how much of an effect some of these, these ancillary items and, and uh, things we carry with us can have. You know, I think it's pretty easy to say, oh, I'm a 165 pounds and my, you know, my bicycle weighs 15 pounds and therefore that's my, you know, my, my system weight is 180 and then you step on the, the scale and I think you'll be surprised to see that it's probably five to seven pounds 
uh, heavier than that just because you know you've, you've got your shoes and your helmet and your clothing and all of that other stuff any spares you're carrying and then really for as much as we all love to be weight weenies, uh, it's always surprising how heavy water is, right? So a couple of water bottles on there and you, you know, <laughs> you'll notice a big change. So total system weight is everything. Get in your gear, step on the scale. That's how you get this number. Th this really is kind of the most critical number to know in the whole system. Um, item two, surface conditions. Okay, surface, what are we, why are we after uh, surface condition. So if you think of the the tire is the spring and it's the softest spring in the suspension system uh, of the bicycle, right? It's in, in a road bike or a gravel bike. It's the only suspension really uh, outside of some flex within the frame. Um, but even in uh, bicycles with suspension, the tire is the softest spring in the system. And so it really drives the spring rate of the whole system. It's also the first thing, you know, we've talked about, I've got my, my Sharpie here, you know, it's the first thing uh, in line to be hitting the road roughness. And so surface condition is really critical um, because that is controlling the, uh, the inputs, the roughness inputs into, uh, into the bike rider system. So we have tried to put, and I will go ahead and pull it up, We've tried to put together, uh, you know, I think it's what, 10 different surface options from, uh, you know, indoor track, outdoor track, new pavement, and, you know, new pavement may look perfectly smooth, but it's not. Uh, and it's not because pavement is actually more about negative spaces than it is about positive uh, protrusions. And so if you think about, you know, the, the reality of even the smoothest pavement as you're rolling over it is that you have all these little negative spaces that, uh, actually force the tire to move about to maintain an equivalent uh, contact patch. And so, you know, new pavement is not as good uh, as, say, say concrete uh, on the velodrome, and you're going to need a little bit lower pressure. Then you get into worn pavement, some cracks, right? Uh, this is going to be different where you are. I, you know, we, we like to joke here in Indiana that uh, you know, what, uh, what this chart calls poor pavement is actually what we would call pretty good pavement uh, here in Indiana. But hopefully the picture helps you uh, make your decision. What, what we're getting at, um, and the way to think of why this is important, is you're trying to understand the amplitudes of the bumps. You know, am I rolling over, you know, things the size of the Sharpie? Are they half that size? Are they a tenth this size? Are they bigger? Um, you know, from the tires perspective and the system mass perspective, uh, we, you know, we're going to use the rider weight. We're going to uh, look at the inputs of roughness, and what we're trying to get to is the spring rate of the tire, right? What spring rate do we ultimately want to land on that's going to give us the maximum efficiency as we're bumping over the bumps, uh, you know, and doing the least amount of shaking and jostling. Uh, of the rider on top of the system. Um, so we go down, we, we've categorized gravel using the category one, two, three, and four, um, which I know is, a f I think, a fairly common way that, that, uh, that people have done it. We've got images, we've got some stuff for you to read here online. And of course, we have cobblestones. The cobbles we are using here um, are uh, not quite Roubaix cobbles. Um, so they're a little bit, I'd say, more on the, uh, the order of like Flanders cobbles, which are the kind of cobbles that you and I are, are likely to actually be riding on. Um, and then the Roubaix level cobbles are really a little bit closer to what we'd call like a Cat 3, Cat 4 gravel. Uh, they are quite brutal um, there. So let's go back. So surface condition, you want to kind of set that. Um, my guide would be to pick, if you're doing an event and say you've got five, six different surfaces, I would generally optimize around the surface that is the either the roughest or the surface that is the most uh, predominant in your event. You know, if you've got an event that's going to be, you know, half type 3 gravel and half a combination of, of you know, five other things uh, with a couple of pavement sections, then, you know, I'd probably uh, optimize around that Cat 3 gravel for that. You know, this is something we do with the pros uh, at, at Roubaix. You know, really, Roubaix is a little bit unique, but, you know, we typically look at 
where the wind is coming from, where we think the attacks are going to go from, and then is it going to is it likely to be finished out in a break uh, or solo, and then optimize around that. You know, when when are you really going to need it? Um, you know, there's a lot of years where the, the direction of the wind means that the riders are all hanging on for dear life in the cobbles, and then the brakes are going to go on the paved sections. And so in those years, we'll actually optimize for the pavement over the cobbles. Um, it's just a couple PSI difference, but it can be important uh, to put the rider in a great spot to, you know, he's got the couple of extra watts um, available when you really need it. So uh, thinking about that for, for your own strategy, uh, I'd typically pick the worst one. Now, this is the one that seems to have everybody kind of uh, a little bit confused, and that is uh, the tire width. And this is the measured tire width. Now, measured tire width is not the tire width on your sidewall, okay? I think we all know this. I think this is a little bit intuitive, but you know, the tire sidewall width uh, on most tires was put there uh, in an era when most rims were 15 or maybe 17 millimeters wide uh, at the bead seat. T today we've got people all over the map. You've got 19, 21, 23, I think there's some 25 millimeter uh, internal bead width gravel rims out there. Each one of those uh, is going to make that tire wider and from a mathematics perspective and a ride quality perspective a 23 millimeter tire that measures 28 millimeters on a wide rim is going to behave uh, as a 28 millimeter tire and not the 23 on the sidewall. So, you know, we've got uh, we've got a measuring guide here on the site. I recommend calipers, and we actually have here in a, a link below a couple of different calipers at a couple of different price points uh, that I would recommend buying. And, uh, and doing this measurement for yourself, because this really is, it, it, these are all super important, but this is maybe the most important one. I mean, every, every millimeter of tire uh, width change is a couple percent change in tire pressure. So, you know, it's, it's probably more important to be accurate about the t actual width of the tire than it is about the rider weight uh, or even picking the surface that you're riding on. This one is super critical. Also note, that a lot of gravel and mountain tires, they are measured, theoretically measured, by the, the width at the knobs and not the width at the casing. So, you know, it is not uh, uncommon to see a, you know, a, a quote, two and a quarter inch uh, tire that actually measures something more like 1.95 inches at the casing. Um, or in a lot of these, you know, the gravel tires that you still get the millimeter measurements, they might say it's a 50, but it might measure 45 or even 44 um, in the casing because mountain and gravel tires tend to be measured, uh, the measurements tend to be more about clearance to the frame, what will fit in a frame, versus the actual casing width itself. Um, so it's super important to measure, buy a pair of calipers uh, down here below and do the measurements for yourself. That's going to give you the, uh, the most accurate measurement. We've included wheel diameter. This is not the most common uh, not the most common and not the biggest factor in rolling resistance, but it does have an effect. And the reason it has an effect um, is that it, the wheel diameter will, combined with the tire width will affect uh, what we call the angle of attack uh, of the, the tire with the road surface. And so in the same way that having a, uh, having a wider tire reduces the got my, my pen here. So if, if my, my wheel is rolling, you know, on, on this pen, um, you think the contact patch may be here, you've got that next bit of tire about to roll, roll under. As the wheel gets smaller, that angle becomes steeper. Uh, that changes the rolling resistance. It also, uh, it changes the efficiency of the tire in terms of uh, recruiting casing and tread to make the contact patch when surfaces get rough. Um, and so smaller wheels tend to have a little bit higher rolling resistance and tend to need a little bit different uh, pressure and pressure strategy. Uh, so we've gone ahead and put that in here. It is also super important to note though that, you know, as tires have gotten big, you've got a lot of equivalencies now where, you know, a, a 700 by, you know, 28 uh, road tire and 
trying to remember offhand, but it's like a you know 650 by 40. They're like the same diameter at the tire, right? So don't think of it in terms of um, you know smaller wheels are slower, bigger wheels are faster. It's really that combination of the the rim diameter and the tire width uh, that you need to have to get this number uh, in, in place. And the good news about this number is the number printed on the wheel is the actual number this time. Uh, it's not just a rough guess like it is on the width. Average speed. So the reason this is in here, uh, faster riders do need slightly higher pressures um, from a rolling resistance perspective, um, but you also need it from a pinch flat resistance perspective. And that, this is I think the coolest thing of our calculator. So in the calculator, we are running the essentially a uh, hundreds of curve fits of these actual pro uh, pro tire pressures and building a, sort of an algorithmic equation uh, that makes all of these curves, trying to find, use this to find where on these curves your number is going to fit. And then over here in the back end, we've got this other calculation churning that is trying to look at, uh, and this is also lab-based, data-based, uh, looking at the energy that uh, it, it takes to break a wheel uh, or pinch flat the tire um, at a certain speed. And the reason this is important, is, as we all know, is you know the optimal pressure sometimes isn't the proper pressure um, if you're going to fly a little bit too close to the sun in terms of this pinch flat resistance. And so we've got this beautiful pinch flat calculator uh, churning away, and it will actually kick out a warning if your setup uh, has an optimal pressure that's just too close, uh, too close to pinch flatting or too close to rim damage, there's a couple triggers in there. It'll even give you some recommendations uh, about how much pressure you should add to get out of the danger zone, and then how much tire width you should add uh, to stay out of the danger zone. You know, typically we're tripping into this pinch flat territory when we have a bike that we just cannot fit. Uh, a wide enough tire in, and then that sort of puts us in a spot of having to make these these uh, more challenging optimization decisions. Uh, you know, things like, well, do I do I run an inefficiently high pressure uh, and not pinch flat, or do I need to maybe find another bike, borrow something? Uh, if I can fit a bigger tire in there, is it worth the money? In a lot of cases, it probably is. So, average speed. Uh, the average speed here, what we're doing is essentially creating a, a distribution of speeds um, based around the type of riding that you're, that you're doing. Uh, and that's giving us a couple of angles here. One to say, you know, you're going to spend X amount of, uh, X percent of time, uh, you know, at, at these top speeds uh, and, and kind of working the, the general distribution curve. So go ahead and put in what you are. You, you can play around and see. I think everybody goes in and uh, you know, plugs in pro tour speed just to see what they get. I think it's going to probably give you, <clears throat> excuse me, an extra PSI or two uh, or so of pressure, but uh, it, it's interesting to play with and see how often you can trip up the pinch flat calculator. And lastly, at the bottom of the screen here, we've got weight distribution. Now, th this is one, my personal belief and the, the data and the math we have on this probably goes against some of the stuff you've heard and seen before. Um, you know, there's a, a lot out there. I think maybe the most famous are the Frank Berto charts uh, on tire drop, uh, where they recommend, you know, taking a front rear um, kind of a, a weight bias or a measurement and, and then finding the, the tire drop for that weight. What we have found is that, you know, if I put you on two scales, uh, and you can do this at home, actually with like a phone book and a scale or, or a piece of wood and a scale, you know, get your system weight, uh, get on your bike, you know, with the, they need to be even in height uh, and thickness, and then you can actually look at the front, uh, the load on the front wheel, you're probably going to find it's something like 40-60, 40% 40, 60, uh, 40 front, 60 rear. The reason we don't use that calculation uh, uh, the way I do it is that, you know, sitting in your garage is one thing, but when you are out on the road, uh, two things happen. As the road turns down, right, you have your, your front wheel, rear wheel, and you start to go down uh, down a steep hill. Um, the grading of the road naturally causes a weight shift onto the front wheel, okay, just from the, the slope of the road. 
But then you as the rider actually tend to get more aggressive and try to get more aero uh, on the bike as you're going at these faster speeds. And that means that you're shifting your weight forward. So do that same test in your garage, get into more of an aero position. And I think you'll find that pretty quickly your weight distribution goes way, way closer to 50-50 uh, than to that 40-60. And at that point on a steep descent, uh, that front tire stiffness really is what's driving the handling uh, and the, the precision of the front end as you're carving corners or, or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, you know, it's critical in braking, uh, you know, having enough tire pressure to handle braking forces if you have to stop suddenly at high speed where even more weight is now going to transfer onto the front wheel. And so because of all those things, uh, I just do not believe in and do not use, uh, you know, static front rear weight uh, to set this up. So our calculator, it goes from 50-50 uh, to what, 46-54. Um, you know, those are, uh, these are what I would consider, um, you know, more realistic positions when you're being aggressive uh, on the bicycle. And let's be honest, it, when you're being aggressive is when this stuff really matters the most. Uh, so that, it just puts our calculator in a little bit of a different place than uh, maybe what you're going to see with some other calculators out there. But from my experience, and, and certainly the athletes that, that I work with, uh, these are much more realistic pressures that, that people actually want to ride. Uh, you know, if we do a, a 40, 60 weight distribution and, and run a front pressure that's, you know, 20% lower than a rear, I, I, I don't think you're going to like it. <laughs> and I can't say, I don't like running like that. I've never met any athletes that like running like that. Um, and so our calculator doesn't do it. So there you go, uh, weight distribution. If you, um, you know, if you don't like that, you can always change the rider weight and set it at 50-50 and, uh, and get equivalence. You know, if you wanted to look at uh, a 40% weight, uh, you know, for a, a, a 200 pound system, then you can just make those reductions uh, in the, the overall mass of the system to find those front and rear pressures. Uh, you are certainly welcome to do that. Lastly on here, and this is one that we want to ask your uh, kind of your support and for your help with, is we've got uh, an additional email box at the bottom. If you give us an email there while you're calculating, then those calculations will be shared with us. And honestly, I, I am fascinated to see what people are doing, uh, what surfaces you're riding, what tire sizes you're riding. Um, you know, the system weights on average. I really want to hear from you how you're using the calculator, and I would love to see your data. So if you want to share the data with us, um, please put that in there. It'll really help us out. I know in the first couple weeks that this was live, we've had more than 20,000 calculations done. Um, but I'd love to see how you're using it. I'd love to hear from you about how you're using it. Uh, and I'd really love to see how our data set shapes out uh, as we see how... Uh, things change, right? Tire sizes change, um, the types of riding we're doing is going to change, and so I really want to build this calculator for the long term to make sure that we're uh, meeting meeting your needs, but also meeting your future needs uh, as we go forward. So having said all that, huge thanks for listening. Uh, please, again, like us, follow us, uh, leave some comments below. I'd love to hear how you're using the calculator uh, and kind of how the numbers it's spitting out are uh, matching up to real world. I'd also love to hear how, uh, you know, maybe certain real world event uh, scenarios match up with the surface condition um, images uh, in our calculator. So maybe we can start putting some uh, some correlations there. You know, this event is like similar to this uh, this surface and help other people find their optimal pressure. So thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time.